Hello, you're all very welcome along to episode seven of the Football Pod here with Tommy Rooney, Paddy Andrews, and James O'Donoghue. How are we doing, boys? Very well. We're in good Magic. form. You're all in good form. Paddy's back in the hood. Thought it was a nice day, oh. Paddy. The weather's back. It's, it's it looks frosty. very nice. Now it was the last few days in lovely in Dublin, but it's very, very chilly. And, uh, I reckon I could pull off the hood. I like Jimmy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we look very edgy now. I'm dying, I'm dying with a cold last. Not COVID, don't worry. Don't worry about me, but uh, they are blocked up the last couple of days. Okay, well, look, probably too many too many early mornings in the golf course already, Paddy. I noticed you on Instagram over the weekend. You're right, you know, going to have to get back at the golf season. Yeah, I yeah you're going to have to get, a, get acclimatized again. James, how are you? Any crack this weekend? Not a thing. Very quiet weekend. Orange weather warning again, actually, tonight in Kerry. Is what? that one about? What? No. Yeah. Tomorrow and the day after, yeah, orange. No. Perfect for training. Jesus. <laughs> Did not see that at all. I was at the beach on Saturday and it felt like it was in Lanzarote. It was absolutely gorgeous. Not that the, the weather wasn't that hot, but it was uh, it was in La Hinch and the place was strong. People are all out enjoying it. So it's nice to have that bit of weather. But uh, Paddy, I have a question for you. Go on. Would you ever put an apology out after a defeat? I know what you're getting at here. And I see... I've unfollowed pretty much all... I don't follow Man United's official account anymore and I don't follow any of their players anymore over these apologies every they're week. They're all fake. They're all complete social media accounts with a run it's by... Ridiculous. So, so Absolute, and like Absolutely. Roy Keane is a bit hysterical now at the best of times, but I agree with him 100% on these apologies. Like, I'm not having them. And it's... Are they in, I haven't seen many of them in the GAA sense. I haven't seen any apologies creeping on in the GAA accounts, but I, I fear that they're, they're probably going to creep in at some stage. What would happen in a dressing room if that's, that crept in? Like, in a GAA dressing room? Destroyed by his teammates. You can't be at that. Like. It's not them, though. Like, There's no way that they are actually going onto Twitter and apologizing for defeat. I don't know. They're just not. I, I just, I remember after England lost in one of the, I don't know, it was the World Cup or the Euros, Harry Maguire had a tweet out like 10 minutes later promoting some vegan burger or something. <laughs> I, he, it's not like he was on the bus going, do you know what I'll do now is I'll tweet about that burger. <laughs> <laughs> it's a social media team that are looking after it like. Lads, give me and one minute here. I'm just going to send this tweet. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't it's, it's laughable yeah. though, isn't it? Like, yeah. And all the sticks they're getting, and they still keep doing them. Like United I, is just a catastrophe because it's literally every week they're, they're having to put out an apology tweet, which is probably more part of the problem. But uh, will we see it in the championship this summer? You couldn't maybe. possibly. You couldn't. I just couldn't. I just. I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule it out. I, I think James is right. Like, I don't think any player would do it, but I just think it's a reflection of the dressing room as well that nobody is saying, right, lads, I know you've got your brand deals or you have your brand to look after. But we can't be coming out after being <laughs> hammered in our local derby. And like, I know I think Jaden Sancho was the first to fall this week. Um, and he's not coming in for that much stick of it. But like, us, oh, the stuff coming out of that dressing room is shocking at the minute. It just points to such a poor culture. Yeah, shambles. Yeah, yeah absolute shambles. It. See, it's so evident even looking at them. Uh, yesterday it was a grim afternoon watching that now I have to say I had a chance to go over to it a couple of buddies were over at it um, and I actually just, I didn't go because I knew I'd stuff on with college at the weekend as well anyway, but I knew it was going to be an absolute shambles and yeah. so it turned out to be so I watched it from the safety of my own home and knew I'd made the right call James um... I don't see what an apology does either because every fan is reading it going, oh, this nonsense again. <laughs> They're yeah. not actually buying it. And the boys off 180 grand a week. They yeah. don't care. Like, I don't think most of them care. The best one, the best one I saw though recently wasn't the United account. It was Thomas Partey from Arsenal who apologised after his red card recently. And it was an official apology that he signed at the bottom. It was like a letter to the fans. Oh, right. But it was just... He went all in. Shocking stuff. James, I don't know if you realise it, but loyal listeners to the pod would know that Paddy Andrews is that much of a Manchester United fan that he did not watch the All Ireland final last year. He went to watch Ronaldo's <laughs> debut. So that just shows you where oh. the loyalties lie on this on this yeah, football side. Brutal so, final, anyway. I knew yeah, it was just, he scored against Newcastle, was it? Twice, yeah. yeah. Downhill from there. Out. It was yeah. a good day. I had a better day. 
over at Old Trafford now and I would have had <laughs> some Tyrone beat me on now. Yeah. He's got the results on Twitter anyway. So it was yeah, bad. yeah, exactly. Um, just keeping with the soccer team, I don't know if you saw it at the weekend, but Jack Byrne was in studio to Shamrock Rovers and Ireland International, former Man City graduate. And uh, a clip was put up on the off the ball account and just kind of caught my eye. And I wanted to kind of put it to you. He was asked to talk about um, Keen Lynch, the hurler, a fella he would have known when he was younger growing up. And I, I don't know if you watched the clip that I sent on to you, if you did your homework, but he raved about Keen Lynch being one of the most naturally gifted soccer players he'd ever seen. Left foot, really? right foot. Yeah, unbelievable. And that Lynch that. Lynch was traveling up and down to Dublin at a time and actually put Hurland to one side for a wee while um, in his teens and was traveling up and down to play with Jack Burns side in, in soccer. And there's a there's a good read about it on the 42.ie as well. But um, What club was that? St. Kevin's. Jack Byrne was Kevin's boys, was he? Yeah, I'll double check here, but I, I'm 99% sure it's yeah. Kevin's. Yeah, so I wouldn't, have, I, I wouldn't, have, I didn't know that, didn't know that at all. I probably wouldn't have thought that. Yeah, Jeez. yeah, yeah. It's it's um un, it's unbelievable. Like when you when you think of him, does he strike you as a soccer player? Where would you no. put him? He definitely no? doesn't strike me as a soccer player, but I suppose I'd say he'd be filthy. <laughs> yeah, he's a centre half, is he? Has to be, doesn't he? Apparently, he had it all. Well, we spoke about it last year. David Clifford played centre centre back in soccer. And he was a very talented centre back by all accounts. Yeah, I think he had, he definitely got offered trials. I think it was Preston, maybe, or one of those. But do you know the Kennedy Cup is where all the boys get spotted for the, mm. yeah, they yeah, yeah. the trial out of it? So Played so it myself too, back in the trial. day. Did you? Yeah, not for DDSL, Bramford. <laughs> we got wiped. Did you? But yeah, all the DDSL team in the Kennedy Cup, all the lads are gone on trials the next week. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. I have an awful sob story about the Kennedy Cup. You didn't make the team on that one either. I missed the voicemail. I would have been number 30 on the squad and I heard the voicemail about a week 30? later on the home phone. Oh, no. I don't know, it was, but it was the Calvin Monaghan side. I was not a soccer player, boys, but I think they were bringing me for the crack. And, the Calvin uh, Monaghan, Kennedy Cup team. I miss it, but there's some good footballers on it. I'm trying to think out of anyone. Oh, it's uh, not good, it's you would have had Killian Clark and Conor Moyner from Calvin on it. And... Uh, yeah. A couple of others around that time as well, but I don't. I don't, I don't, I don't think I missed my calling as a soccer player. <laughs> James, were you good? I was all right. I went to Kennedy Cup. I was. Yeah. Uh, you could guess I was a lazy left winger. Ah, get out of here! <laughs> I know <laughs> what you were like. You Rashford. were John. Yeah, Marcus Rashford. There. Yeah. No, I John Robertson. on the right back over the top. John Robertson. Did you ever watch the miracle? The 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 Nottingham Forest. That's Forest. I believe in miracles. Yeah, I believe in miracles. I fell in love with John Robertson after watching that. He was such a lovely, dainty footballer that wouldn't exist nowadays. Um, but I'd say you were a bit like that, James, were you? Simpler times back then, Tom. Yeah, yeah, no, it really was. There was a lot of hacking going on back then as well, like because you get away with any sort of a tackle. Mm. And especially Johnny Aaron Kerry. If you took a fella on, you were you were taking your life into your hands, like anything could happen. You were asking for it. Left, you left for side him with the defenders, like yeah, yeah, yeah. buddy, you trying to dribble by him. You were asking yeah, for that. We were decent, but soccer is a great, um, a great thing to get to get into, if, especially if you're playing football, because there's certain skills that kind of transfer over. But uh, if you're playing them both at the same time, you kind of get into bad habits as well. Do you think? When I was playing both of them, I was I probably had soccer as my number one for a long time. But I used mm. when you're playing, you kind of wait for the ball a bit. Do you know when you're getting a pass? And yeah. in football, if you wait for the ball, it's going to be it's, it's going gone. to be taken off. It's gone, yeah. So uh, after a while, you do have to make your pick. But if you can play a couple of sports for as long as possible, it's definitely the right yeah. way to go. We touched on it last year, but Moran was big on it as well, like mm. the coaching background, and, and he was the same. But it's always who was the best. Uh, well, Kevin Andy's, Nolan. Kevin, oh, Nolan, Kevin was, Nolan, yeah, was a brilliant soccer player. He was over in the UK. Um, Man of, man of the match in the All 2011 All Ireland final. Yeah. He was. He was scored a, a, a very famous point for Dublin. Um, and kind of finished up. He, he, he was a bit injuries or he, with the health issues. I, I think mm. he finished up with Dublin probably a little bit earlier that, than he would have hoped anyway. But he was a brilliant soccer player. Paul Manu was very good soccer as well. Who else was good in Dublin? McCall, he was obviously. two fellas wear their socks up. Well. Kevin Nolan wore well, socks up. He did, yeah. yeah. He yeah. the menu. Yeah, that's, that's it, the soccer. Yeah. There's the habits you're talking about. So did Andy Moran. Shin guards in as well. Yeah, yeah. He did. I don't know if he's a shin guards in now, but he definitely had the socks up. Who else was good at soccer? Um, Brogan. Brogan, not good at soccer, no? 
not ah uh, no no you not played. to their level like the lads were the lads were were proper like yeah they both played in Ireland underage as well like they, okay. were, they were serious players like we all talk see everyone thinks they're good at soccer but then you play an L game yeah. and you realize lads are brutal like, there's there's some fellas that uh John Heston played um Ireland underage was on a very talented yeah. Ireland team and went on trials to Derby County um actually Keen Lynch played with Kevin's so he was up and down the road for two yeah. years from Limerick to Dublin Aaron Byrne from Dublin was on that same team in Kevin's. I hadn't realized that. So, um, Aaron Byrne, Aaron in Dublin. Yeah. Yeah. I think. He, yeah. Yeah. He's only living around the corner there, anyway. So, it's a it's slightly easier commute for Aaron Byrne to play Kevin's boys than poor L. Kane Lynch. We've got some mileage there. Yes. Yeah. Well, 100%. Yeah. James, anyone in Kerry freakishly good at other sports? The only one I'm thinking of is obviously Donahue. Yeah. And yeah. talk about a sport transferring to your football scene. Like yeah. the way. He could just stick his his backside out and and catch the ball out. You know, it was some skill to have. If I could go back, I'd probably play. I play basketball as much as I could. But Jason Foley at the moment, Kerry's okay. fullback, was a two hundred meter sprinter. Right. And the pace off him is sick. Oh, really? He is lightning. I think he was a hurdler. He's, as he's well, a big fan as well. Like, like he's, yeah, he's strong he, enough bloke as well. Like, he's six foot anyway. Yeah, but he can he can move. Like if you put the time into that kind of speed development and speed mechanics when you're young, the transference over to football must be unbelievable. Yeah. Can only imagine. Um, just from some of our conversations last year, Andy was a big advocate for the importance of playing a sport. So maybe in the G8 underage, you might be the best in that squad or very good in that team. But going to another sport and being out of your comfort zone and realizing and learning what it's like to be part of a squad where maybe you're fulfilling a more functional role or you're doing slightly different. It's just massive for development. So, yeah, yeah no, that's that's interesting here. That's, it's interesting here about Foley. I'm surprised there's more GA stars who are, you know, headline athletic stars. Maybe it just isn't pushed enough. I don't know. Maybe it's just too different. Maybe you've got to specialize a mm-hmm. lot earlier, do you know? Like, who are the fastest players in GA now? Like? See, Foley kind of, he doesn't really attack much, so you don't see it. Well, it's not I, as obvious. I'll tell you one fella yeah. who is. Watching that clip last week of Shane Walsh bursting by Shane Matty Walsh. Taylor for that yeah. goal. You know, we were talking about it earlier on. We had a call. Like, the speed that that man clocked up was unbelievable. <laughs> and, like, Matty and Taylor, Taylor is not slow. He's not slow, James. No. No. Uh, and he well, ends up- it's just different grade. We, we played- <laughs> that reminds me. We played him in Salt Hill. Now, this, he must have been awful at this stage. This must have been 17, 18. It was the year they were going. Oh, 18 it would have been. So, actually, I was getting that. Uh, it was the year they were decent, the Kevin Walsh's last year. What was his last year? They won Connacht anyway. That's a date. And we ended up playing them in the league final. <laughs> yeah, they were decent. 18. <laughs> yeah, they were great. <laughs> having a great since. But um, oh, we were playing them in South Hill. And they, that year, they were bringing everyone back. That was their kind of style. That they, they'd kind of keep Comer up and bring most of the lads back and try and hit you on the break. And we turned the ball over. Um, and I was kind of, for some reason, I was around the top of the D. And Shane Walsh took off like, and we were prepared for this style of play. So it was just tag the runners, get on through. <laughs> I, I literally tried to jump on his back, and I couldn't even get him. <laughs> In the space of about three yards, he was gone, and I was just looking around, going, "There's so many bodies around. Hopefully, people won't notice." Yeah. <laughs> how, how bad an attempt this was to try and tag him, but uh, it was pointed out to me that uh, literally <laughs> in the space of three yards, he'd made. Yeah, my lack of pace was shown up there at that point. But he's the most uh, comfortable runner. Like he doesn't even look like he's trying to he, run. He, he's gliding. He's gliding. Just yeah, such yeah. a natural runner. But, but it, with that goal, he uh, went from I'd say he got the ball maybe on just outside the forty-five. I think. Oh, you're talking sixty meters out. Originally, he only, took one, he only took one hop. Oh, he's involved in the play early on. Sorry, yeah, yeah. He gets it outside the forty-five. Yeah. One when hop. he gets it back, he he goes from outside the forty-five yeah. to, to penalty spot with one hop. Like it's just. <laughs> Power, just massive strike, and power run. A, a lot of people were crying on, on Twitter about that he took steps. I didn't feel like he did take steps. It's such a grey rule, steps. It's such a grey rule in the GA. you know? You're allowed four, between four and six. Or you always get away with a few more. You do, like. You always get away with a few more. Oh, it was, it was just the... But it was the power gems. I know what you're talking about when you say the Shane Walsh glides. It feels like he glides when he takes off, but that... He was going full pelt there. The speed he was going, the power he was going. It, took off he, it, doesn't, it doesn't look like it. That, that's, it's, it's, nearly, it's natural. Like, like there's lads who 
when they're going fast, they're straining every muscle. You can see their veins <laughs> popping out of them. And then there's other lads who are just naturally flyers and they're just cruising across the ground. McCarthy was like that with Dublin with us. He'd be doing drills and you're thinking, this, this fella's not even trying here. And he's absolutely flying past fellas. Shane Walsh has that. Yeah. Like, if anyone else? Myler, Myler is, I think Myler's probably not the raw pace, but he just covers so much ground. You can yeah. see he's flying up and down the pitch. Jason Paddy Durkin would be a good must man. watch that. Paddy oh, Durkin, yeah. Durkin. There was a clip of Durkin. There was a Mayo's counter attack and score. The winner, well, not the winner, but a security win against pitch, our man. Yeah. The length of the speed. I'd love to see the two of those boys in a race at the minute. Do you ever, I don't know, you wouldn't, I doubt you'd remember it, but would you be aware of Irish superstars? The show that was on back in the 70s and back 80s. The 80s like. Yeah. We need to bring that back. We need to get that <laughs> back on the table. Um, 1979, Pat Spillane is the winner. 1980, Bernard Brogan Sr. is the winner. And 1981, Declan Burns wins it. So, like, it was, like, in 79. I'm just going to look at the list here, 79, who competed. But... What did they get for it? Eight, eight they sports, ended, was it? Eight sports. You ended up going on to compete in the World Finals. So, Spillane went to the World Finals, the World Superstar Finals, and he's competing against professional athletes from across the board. That's Rory Sunburn. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, it's in, it's in the States somewhere. <laughs> the most carry phone of all time. Like, <laughs> Canadian <laughs> footballer. <raw> <laughs> Canadian footballer Brian Budd won, right? So he won back to back two years. You end up winning forty thousand dollars at the time. Spillane finished eleventh, but he was an amateur competing against professional sports people. So that's really, really impressive. Um, so you had gym, swimming, hundred meter sprint, the bike, rowing. There were so many other different bits and pieces. Like, but uh, yeah, it'd be it'd be very interesting to see what Irish players would be put forward. Each county has to nominate one player. And put them together into the mix. That'd be that'd be one worth following. The only thing we don't really have time to play the GA season. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. Squeeze in <laughs> on the reality weekend, TV though. show as well. Just on the sly. I can't make training this week. I'm doing. Uh, I'm doing the role for superstars. Super yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you see Pat's plan rehab when he when he did the cruciate? He said oh. he just tied weights around his ankles and did laps. What? Yeah. Oh so my you. god. I'd say it was cruel. See, but back then, yeah, like the cruise ship was, you were a goner. Like, at that stage. Yeah. yeah. Like Colin O'Rourke, I remember, came back from two. I think it was two. And it was like a miracle that he came back from those, those cruise ships. Like it was. What, what year was it? Not 91 against Down in the final, where he's wearing a leg brace that are like he should not be on the pitch. Like. <laughs> he, Colin O'Rourke had pneumonia at halftime at that game against Down and come on in the second half. Like he yeah. was shivering in the dressing room, wrapped in blankets. Yeah. And his leg and was literally like, come on and spirit the, the leg like. to the leg. Like. Yeah. Oh, but like that, watching those games back was magic. Like O'Rourke, he would just shove by his sad. shoulder and bomb it over from 40 yards. And it doesn't look like the leg should be on there. Like, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> they were <laughs> different men. They were different creatures yeah. back then. When men were men. Yeah. Different creatures. So look, <laughs> let's talk a bit of football. I suppose, lads, there oh, was yeah, yeah. five games at the weekend. We were in division two where Galway, Kept their 100% record going. They bet awfully 270 into 310. Quite a high scoring game in Pierce Stadium. Damien Comer looks like he may be back to his best. He scored 1 3. That was good to see. Fermanagh had a big win in Division 3. They held off Leash 315 to 39. And Longford won the Midlands El Classico. They bet Westmead by four points, 14 points to 10. So a big win for Longford, which kind of gives them a chance of staying up in Division 3. Those two teams are meeting in the Championship in a couple of weeks' time. I think it's about six weeks' time they're going to be meeting in the Championship, so a bit of shadow boxing going on, I'm sure. Down in Division 4, we had Sligo 10 points, Cavan 113. Paddy Lynch scored 1-2 for Cavan. Garrow McKiernan scored 5 points. Cavan keeping up their run of holding off teams by 5 or 6 points at the minute uh, as they make their way out of Division 4. And what about this for a scoreline? Wexford 15 points. Tipperary 4-4. Four, four. Tip win by a point. Paddy, I know you were doing the maths there in your head there. and You'd be a good man with numbers. <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's like 4-4. Four, four, four. Halftime yeah. score was uh, Wexford 11, tip 3-1. Do you ever play a game like that? I remember there was a famous under-21 final. Yeah, Michael like Meehan. under-9 or something like that. <laughs> yeah, there was a famous under-21 final on Michael Meehan in 2006. I think it was like 4-6 to 3-5 or something like that. That go away. No, uh, did not, him and Armstrong both got hat-tricks. Oh, it was against that down. It? Was that against them? Were you beaten in the oh, semi final that year? Or were you minor? You were minor then, weren't you? No, I was minor. Uh, 2005, it was in uh, Mullingar. Me, me and, and Armstrong both got hat tricks, I thought. I think you're right. 
I was reading this back recently. Yeah, bit of knowledge there. Yeah. Were you born, Jimmy? <laughs> <laughs> they were outrageous in that 21s, the two boys. Yeah, they yeah. were sick. They're actually famous for that. You know, not many fellas actually come out of 21s with like, had won so it. much credit. So, like, ran the show three years before in 2002 in the 21 final when they hammered Dublin. Yes. Dublin had a really good 21 team. And Mike, so, Mike, he would have been, what, 18? So, just out of minor. And he was phenomenal. And that's when he was in Port Leash. He was at that game. Like, like we touched, it was the last, or a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about him. Like, mm. Well, it was, it was James. Underage career, like, it was yeah. James who put him in his fantasy seven-side Gaelic football team. And you got commended across the country for that pick, James. A lot of our picks got hammered, but you got credit for that one. Paddy, you were dead right. Go away 6-5, down 4-6, May 2005. That's Michael Meehan scored the final three. score? 6-5. Yeah. Yeah. Michael Meehan scored 3 Six three, goals, two. five points. Yeah. Me and scored three two. Armstrong scored three one. Uh, two of the boys. That game single handedly brought in the blanket defense. Connor Laverty was playing <laughs> for down that day. Scored one two. A man is still doing the business in the club final. Marty Clark was playing for down. Mark Poland, Aiden Carr, um, Finney and Hanley was playing for Galway. Like they were, they were good teams. Um, if I'm Marty, not mistaken, Mar- uh, Marty Clark was minor at the time. Could well have been. Him and James Colgan were the two minor lads. I think they won the minor all Ireland. Okay. Yeah, he was playing as twenty ones as well. Then he was yeah. a savage operator, Marty Clark. Oh, so player. magic! So stylish. The socks so up as well. Left. Yeah, socks, socks up. up. Yeah. Socks yeah, up as well. Player. I'm seeing a trend, lads. I'm seeing all the best. All the best lads had the socks up. When you he came back as well, he didn't have. Do you know a lot of the the AFL boys? They have kind of a rusty six months to a year. He just mm. came straight back into it and was outstanding. Oh, he was a standard setter. The second he was back in, he was a standard setter. Yeah. But he's a very highly rated coach as well. I don't know if you've seen some he's of the, doing stuff. A bit of coaching, oh, some the clips. Yeah, yeah, he's working with Laverty with the down twenties himself. Sean Boylan, Connor Laverty. I think there's someone else involved as well. So Sean Boylan, but Sean Boylan was in the down twenties last year. Yeah, up and down with the down twenties, working with Connor Laverty. Be very close to Connor Laverty, and uh, I think Connor asked him to take get involved maybe last year with that down team that got to the All Ireland semi final. They won won that Ulster final against Monaghan, and. Yeah, Laverty's back with them again. Sean Boylan's back involved again. So, um, good management team there. Eh? Unbelievable. Very impressive. And Marty Clark is building up a big, a big kind of rapport there as well. So, Marty Clark in 2010, James, you were only 18, 19 then. You're 19, yeah. looking in from the outside. He was one of my favorite footballers back then. He and was then. savage. Himself and Benny Coulter. Yeah. Big Benny. Exhibition. Yeah. It's a great down team, wasn't it? They, they beat Kerry. Do you remember in the quarterfinal? Yes. Um, yeah. Killian Young slipped the ball to Dunica Walsh for a goal and it w- was the turning point of the game and the ref called it back for a, a throw and when you actually see the replay it was a clear legit you're, 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 you're not bitter about it 12 years later <laughs> this is like this is like the fifth time in six weeks that James has brought up a refereeing decision that <laughs> carry over the last you think Kerry should have won every All-Ireland this century <laughs> only for the best like. oh but that is the standout moment of that game like just let down have their moment. <laughs> it was one game 12 years ago and they, they, they nearly back Cork in the final as well compared to them they, they probably, did that was quite a random season wasn't race. it like that all Ireland kind of out of nowhere like. yeah but I feel like Kildare were in the, it was Kildare and Down in one semi and Dublin who were were not great at the time against mm. Cork and the other one so it was I, a bit uh, I feel like we maybe year. we maybe heading back to that sort of era at the minute do you know like yeah. I feel like that's kind of where we're at, that there's seven or eight teams that are maybe in the mix that maybe feel like they can get there. Kerry, obviously, in my mind, would be the standout at the moment, but they just haven't done it yet. So I think it's, it's an open season. It's back around 2010, 2011, 2012, where any one of six counties were competing in all Ireland finals. It was six different counties. No. Yeah, it was six different counties in those three all Ireland finals. So well, It might be someone who, who brings something different in terms of game plan or style like when McGuinness went into Donegal yeah. and he just tore it up and went, went with his own route and ended up yeah. winning an like it needs someone to come in and just do innovation to win one yeah 100% mm-hmm. alright lads well we've got a bit of a plan for the rest of the episode that we're going to go through we're going to focus on Galway here after this we have a couple of questions in on Galway I have a couple of questions for the two of you on Galway and where they can get there we're going to look at the, the three teams with 100% records Galway, Derry and Cavan focus them mostly on Galway um we're going to then have a look at round five. It's hard to believe it, but there's only three rounds of the league left. We're flying through the season and we're getting to the crunch stage of the league. So some 
big games on TV this weekend. There's actually five games on TV. Armagh Kildare is going to be on BBC on Saturday evening. I'm pretty sure you can also get it on GA Go. Uh, Kerry Mayo is going to be on RT that evening. Sunday, Donegal Monaghan on TG Carr at 1.45. Tyrone Dublin at 3.45. And Mead and Cork will be available on the TG Carr app. Paddy was questioning why on earth Mead and Cork would be on the TV. But it's actually a, a relegation <laughs> playoff. Paddy, so uh, it's a big deal. So we're going to be pre those back games. To its traditional route there, Joe and Cork and Mead. Like. Yeah, like talk about where they're both at. Like Mead were in two semi-finals in 07, 09, All Ireland semi-finals. You wouldn't believe it, but they were. Oh they nine, lost, lost to Cork in 07 and lost to Kerry in 09, the All Ireland semi-final. Mead were in the All Ireland semi-final. No, no. Yeah, yeah, lost to Kerry replay. in the rain. Was it really? No, lost low-scoring game. Maybe, maybe it was two seven to one nine or one one nine to one six or something. That was a very low-scoring game in the rain. Um, but Mead oh, were two, two semi finals back then. Darren scored a penalty, didn't he? He hit, he did, he hit it off his two feet. Oh, was that it? A Dennis Irwin scuffed off him. Did he, he went in. Left legged. I think he took the penalty with his right and he hit it off his left and it went in. <laughs> That's class. That's pure <laughs> class. That good soccer player, Darren, as well. He so, meant it, didn't he? <laughs> Who was a goal? Uh, Roy Murphy. Kerry 2-8, Mead 1-7. That's what it was that day. I mean, I was actually, I was in the queues again that day watching that. I'm pretty sure actually Darren scored into the goal I was behind. Uh, Paddy Rourke was in goals for Mead that day. So it was... was he? No, 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 no. Yeah, so Chris O'Connor, Anthony Moyes in, in the full back line. Keem Ward was shooting the lights out back then, scored 1-4. Brian Farrell, mm-hmm. David Bray was a quality footballer for Mead that David we didn't Bray, probably yeah. see enough out of over the next couple of years. Stephen Bray obviously won his all-star or got nominated in 07. So yeah, it was a funny time in Mead football. Anyways... We're not really allowed to talk about Mead in this podcast at the moment. So that's what's coming up in the show. We've got a load of questions in as well in the in our football pod listeners section where the lads are going to put uh, be put to the test. So we've got a couple of good ones in our free taking on the top informed players in the country and a couple of other interesting ones too. And then we'll finish with our fantasy football. So you're listening to episode seven of the football pod. Thank you very much for tuning in so far. Do hit subscribe. Do share the podcast if you can. We're going to be right back after this and we're focusing on Galway. You are very welcome back to the Football Pod with Paddy Andrews and James O'Donoghue. I'm Tommy Rooney. I'm your host of the Football Pod. Two lads are the stars. They're the boys that do all the talking on social media. You won't hear any apologies from them after the podcast today. It'll be just listen. Have a listen. There won't be no apologising. Paddy, go away. Um, You spoke about them earlier on that they had their their good season in 2018. Do you think there's any chance that Joyce can get them back to the top table? Well, he's ticking all the boxes that he needs to tick so far this season. They'll himself, John Divley, obviously their third year in there. We felt that their, their first season they were they were probably caught between two stools. That the game plan they had under Kevin Walsh, like you say, in twenty eighteen, it was based around defensive solidity, and that got them to a point. Won a Connacht title, got to a league final, got to an All Ireland semi final. Players probably don't enjoy playing that style as much, particularly in Galway, where they're kind of very exciting players that traditionally wouldn't be very expansive in how they play. Joyce obviously comes in, that's his style as, as a player, of course, one of the best players of his generation and wants to move away from the probably more turgid game plan of being overly defensive. And they were kind of caught between two stools. Now, I'm saying that as well. Some of their key players were injured for a bad record over the last couple of years. I think Damian Comer was such a leader for them as well. But first half of last year's Connacht final, it looks like they're in business. They're on top of that Mayo team. Their key players are playing well. well the likes of Shane Walsh and things like that. But then Mayo turn up the heat, as, as Mayo, <laughs> Mayo can do. And Galway just crumbled. And that would have been a yeah. massive defeat for them in terms of the fallout from that, the manner of the defeat that they were, look, what we touched on it when we re- reviewed the game last summer, they were bullied really. Mm. They were bullied off the park. And Mayo, an experienced team, they play in a, in a physical style. You could see that, that they just went after Galway in that second half and Galway didn't have any answers. And it was a really disappointing way for them to be defeated after obviously being relegated from Division 1 in a game against Monaghan and Clonus that in no way should they have lost that game. But decision-making, just inexperience cost in that game. So it was a massive season for Galway coming in this year. Down in Division 2, the key thing for them was hit the ground running, make sure they get promotion back 
into Division 1. And as you said, Tommy, and, and we've looked at this season, it is as open a season across the border. There's not that gap of Dublin and Kerry kind of striding off into the distance. Mayo with massive turnover. Who are going to be the top team in, in Connacht? If you win a provincial title this year, you are in the mix for the whole thing. And Galway would have been targeting that. So we said, what, what will we see from them this spring? They went out, they won the FBD League, and they've cleaned house in every game they played in Division 2. Now, you caveat that saying it is only Division 2, but they're racking up massive scores. They look really, really fit, really powerful. Their key players are back from injury and are to the fore of what they're doing. And they brought in Keane O'Neill as well, who had massive experience, obviously, over the last decade, but lots of different teams to supplement what Parrick Joyce and Divley and these guys are doing. So everything we've seen from them to date, they have ticked every box over the next couple of weeks. Now, again, they play Roscommon, they play Derry, who are really the two other top teams in Division 2. You'd probably get a bit more sense of where mm. they're at. But they can't be anything but happy with how the season has gone to date over the first two and a half months. Yeah. James, I'd be interested to get your take on, on Galway last summer because, Paddy, I would say that we... We were probably quite strong against about Galway's defeat last year because, and you're right, you said they were bullied. Like it wasn't just that they were bullied; it was that they were physically kind of and psychologically beaten that day by by Mayo. Like. But, but it was a bad defeat, Tommy. And it's like you know, it's not our style to be. We're not looking to sensationalize things or throw anyone under the bus or any of that type of nonsense. But you were looking at that game, the first half, really positive. They're on top. Their key players are playing well. And the Mayo come out and sense blood. And that what like no team ever likes hearing that. They, they've been bullied or mm. psychologically they've been got at. But that second half, it, men against boys, really, was yeah. how it looked. Well, Horan and, brought and, on. And, and that could be a massive part of a team's development as well. Yeah. That the coaches and players can look at that. Like I say, no team wants to be be accused of that. But we're just looking at, the, at what we've seen in front of us. And it was mm. like, this, this is an inexperienced team and Mayo using all, all the things that have made Mayo a brilliant team over the last decade. And yeah, it's, it's physical. <laughs> it's, it's in your face, but that's what Mayo do well. And that's, yeah. that's what it takes to, to win there's, these games and to win t- provincial titles and compete for all Ireland. So I think all we would have taken a massive amount of lessons from that, as harsh as it would have been at the time, as well as the, the game they lose against Monaghan in the last game of the league, which was a massive game for them as well. And you can see they haven't been fully tested yet, but like I said, no. everything we've seen to date has been an improvement from what we've seen uh, throughout last season. Yeah, they obviously lost um, Rob Finnerty early to an innocuous clash with Porter Gahor in that game. Sean Kelly went off injury, injury was massive. Shane Walsh was lying down for a few minutes after getting nailed late. There was a behind the scene gold shot of Padraig O'Hara slamming one of the Galway boys to the ground. A lot of people were picking that out afterwards, saying maybe Galway don't have that edge that Mayo have. James, I don't know what your, your reading of Galway has been over the last little while or what you think of them this year so far. I think last year they never they never got going at all. They got a good clipping against Kerry down in Tralee, and they had a couple yeah. of other dodgy results. And I was kind of thinking, if any team could go down to Division Two and be all right with it, it's probably Galway because they can get a bit of confidence, they can get a few good results and they can bounce on from that. But last year, you know, they got a couple of bad results and next thing they were in the, the kind of final against Mayo and it just all went, it all went wrong. But this year, they'll definitely have more of a step-by-step progression. They'll have a lot of confidence. They'll have, they'll have momentum built up. You know, it could be, it could be the right route for them yeah. rather than getting, you know, having an up and down Division one, just have a nice, comfortable run at Division two and straight into the championship might suit them. COVID and the pandemic splitting that season in 2020 probably affected Porrick Joyce as much as it did anyone else because he had Galway absolutely flying early in the spring that year. And then they came back after the league, couldn't get going at all, were beaten by a point by Mayo in the, in the Connacht final. And then Mayo obviously went on to the other in semi final. So fine lines between what can happen. Now, one change that Galway did make, and Paddy mentioned it, was that they brought in Keane O'Neill in the offseason. Um, James, he's a fella who, as your career was starting to take off, was brought on board in Kerry. He's like Keen O'Neill has worked in a, a number of counties in the last decade, you know, and had plenty of success along the way. He's been in with the Tipperary Hurlers, he's been in with Limerick, he's been in with the Cork Footballers, he's been in 
manager of Kildare himself. He's worked with Mayo when they've got to All-Ireland finals. Mourinho of GAA. I don't know if it's Mourinho or if it's an, uh, is it Antonio Con- Well, James, talk to us about <laughs> yeah. the man you know, the coach you know, Keane O'Neill, because he was announced alongside, is it Mikey Sheehy at the time? Jeremy Murphy as part of Eamon Fitzmaurice's ticket in October 2012. Here it is. October 15, 2012, but reported by the Kerry men at the time. Mikey Sheehy, Dermot Murphy, Keane O'Neill ratified as selectors for Kerry. O'Neill will also train the team. So that was under Eamon Morris after he replaced Jack O'Connor. Yeah. Talk to us about what that was like. What, did, what role did Keane O'Neill play in the Kerry setup back then as well? Keane was... So Eamon was the manager and then Keane was trainer, strength and conditioning everything else and I was in well at the time and Keen had a, a big a big role in um in that side of the house in UL mm. and we knew how good he was at the time and when he got that job with Eamon it was a case of whoa you know he had a huge reputation at the time he was after winning the All-Ireland with Tip Hurlers I think they lost a the final or two as well but he had a savage reputation and when he came down we were thinking we have the right man here with Eamon. It just seemed to be a good fit. And there was excitement straight away. Even with the appointment of the coach, there was excitement. And mm. I remember the first, um, the first meeting we had. We had Jack before that. And Jack was obviously a brilliant manager. But it was kind of a bit rougher around the edges. Um, and Keen <laughs> came down and we had this presentation. And it, he put up this chart. There was colours everywhere. There was <laughs> graphics <laughs> It was like, oh, my God, we're so organized. You know, it was like he went through. <laughs> he went through. Phases. That's all it took, a few charts. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. But he went through phases of like endurance, power, speed all through the, the season. And it was all in a plan. And we hadn't seen that before. I was like, Jesus, this is we're on the right route here. And he had every game we were going to play all the way up to the third weekend in September for the, for the All-Ireland final. We didn't get there in the end, but it just looked like we were on a plan. And he, it was kind of what the group needed at the time because I think we were coming off, obviously, having all those great players. And there was a, a lot of us under 21s after coming through. And a lot of fellas are probably thinking, I'm not going to play much here, but at least there was a plan for you in your strength and conditioning, in your fitness, in your football. And he hit the nail in the head there. But like his coaching was was different level. Like and, and what yeah. like what talk to me, what kind of a football coach? Because when I think of a coach going into Kerry, I would imagine that most Kerry law, and maybe this is a cliche, but in comparison to other counties, say most footballers in Kerry have the basic skills. Like there is a level in Kerry, it's nearly like Kilkenny Hurlers that you're born with a football in your hands. He that. He you have that level of that. Skill. what kind of football skills did you have in, in or what did he do in, in sorry, what did he do in Kerry? Like what kind of he had I wouldn't say he, he simplified it, but he promoted skill development straight away. Right. And he didn't take anything for granted. He didn't say, all right, mm. these lads are good kickers or good passers or anything. Or He took nothing for granted. And we went skill, 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 skills constantly. And it was, it was unreal training. Coupled with the, with the speed and agility work, you, you get a serious bounce off of come the summer when you have that, that kind of work done. And he didn't believe in cones. So like you'd never be waiting at a cone to get a ball or waiting in a line to get a kick. It was all very fluid stuff um, where you'd, you'd be constantly catching, kicking. Um, just there was no kind of mad drills. It was just constant touching of the ball and constant improvement that way. But, what is his background, G? Because like, it's interesting from the Dublin side because he managed or was involved with a lot of our biggest competitors over yeah. the last decade. Yeah. We don't know him. Uh, like he was obviously with, with Kerry, with Mayo, with Kildare. So we would have played against his teams and would have had big battles against them. But what, what is his actual background? Like, is he, he, played, he played for Kildare. Does he have a football background? Like? Yeah, he played for Kildare. And I think he had a bad accident. And oh, really? He had a very bad back injury. And it, it haunted his, his career, yeah. But he was supposed to be an excellent player. But that, that kind of stopped him. But he obviously mm. had the passion and he had the science behind him through... Mm through the university and he kind of went from there mm. but he 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 enjoyed like he was a big talker as well do you know like he liked to really yeah he liked to kind of <laughs> chat things through but we do really? a lot of kind of walkthroughs and like we'd be doing kind of 
we'd walk through breaks and things like that. I bet you the Galway boys now will be talking about the Ring of Steel. That was his big thing where the ball, went, the ring long. Of steel, go on. What the ball went long. The centre back, if it went walk, long to the, to the 10 spots, say. Yeah. Number six would come in at a certain time. The number five would come in, 11 would come across, 13 would come in, and you'd form that kind of ring of big men there to compete. Just the kick out. From yeah, from the kick out. We do we do all those walkthroughs. He was very good at them. Yeah, yeah. Where you kind of understand every little part of it. They drive you mad, maybe at the time when you want to be playing football, but mm. when it comes down to the big moments, sometimes you kind of need a bit of that. But he but had a, you, a big aura, a big James, Would you say timing wise as well, not just for, for you guys, like say the, the dynamic of your group that like say the more established and senior guys were probably coming to the end. So you were regenerating a lot of younger guys coming through who, who are obviously eager to learn. But also just where, where GAA was, at, that's 10 years ago. Mm. That all teams, like you're talking about walkthroughs now and things like that, that's a given nearly across the board for, for every team, I'd say. But his kind of science, science and that organisation, things like that, that was where the GAA was going. And he was one of the real first coaches to really bring that in as yeah. well, I'd say. But I, I was like kind of chasing that coach figure so long after. I was like, who is another Keen O'Neill? Do you know? Because mm. he was, he did kind of a bit of everything. What did he bring to you, to your game? Like you're 19, 20 in 2012. What's he bringing to your game? You're a bit older, are you? In 12, I was 21, yeah. 21. Um, I suppose I, I drove him mad at the start anyway. I know that because <laughs> I was a bit airy fairy. And, uh, oh. What do you mean? You just wanted to practice shooting, was that it? I'd say I was just the kind of fellow who drive a coach and a manager berserk. What, so kicking, kind of kicking when they're talking, doing solos when they're talking? <laughs> Maybe, no, not kind of that <laughs> stuff, but just... It was like, even though I did, like, I obviously, my commitment was 100%, but I didn't probably didn't come across like that all the time. Okay. And um, I remember we were training at half six in the, in the gym one morning in New Ireland, like half six... In college is very early. Like a lot of fellas wouldn't be able <laughs> to only get in at that stage. Still home and away at half one. <laughs> so we were, I missed one of those anyway, and it put us off on a, on a bad start. But um, after a while, then he, you know, you you get to to warm to each other, and I got a lot out of him because I thought his training was so on point. There was no, there was no, there was nothing thrown in. Everything was kind of designed for you, and as well, we talk about kind of this was 10 years ago, he'd actually break the session up into inside forwards would be doing a certain conditioning mm-hmm. drill versus a half forward versus midfielder, which I know isn't even happening now in, so, in some teams. Do you know, like the, the, the running you'd be doing, we t- spoke about the GPS, the running mm. you'd be doing in the different positions, it's night and day. It's like a different sport. And he was, he was on to all that stuff. Okay, um, That's, it's interesting because you, and you said you were always searching for that coach after, like what do you mean by that like that? I suppose he was just, he was top, top notch, I thought. Um, but he probably, you know, like like every coach, when you have such a strong voice, strong personality, big aura, you probably do run out of time with a group. So when he, he left in, in 15 after we lost and he went to, he took the Kildare job. But we used to, we used to go on trips to Portugal for training trips. Did you, mm. you went on them, Paddy, didn't you? No. Didn't you? Actually, no, we... We never did that, though. I would have loved to. But took the money. No money to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but we went and, oh, they were savage. I can't believe you didn't do them. They were savage no. trips for, like, style of play, even to sharpen you up for camaraderie, everything. But Keen had come into his own in those settings. You'd be training three times a day for mm. five days. So there might be a gym session, a skill session, and a speed and agility session. Mm. And um, he, was, he was the man there. He'd really... Take, take control was that. that a bit would was that a big change from would you say to go from like the coaching side and the more scientific side to then going into the head manager job in Kildare like mm, I was going to ask you that like that yeah. it, I, I'm surprised with hearing that that like if he's what officially brought in to carry as the strength and conditioning coach would he have been and then Eamon and the lads are doing the, the football side of things the fence and forward but he was doing pretty much all he of that doing, he, yeah he wanted a piece of, piece of everything it's odd now yeah or, or not, maybe suppose. not odd it obviously worked for him but, but what I side, presume I presume Jim Gavin didn't do anything to coach 
No, like, like we, we were, like you're talking about Keane O'Neill, obviously we were blessed. We had a guy called Martin Kennedy uh, who came in with Jim. He's actually with the IRFU now. He was there 13, 14, 15 with us. And a very similar experience to what you're saying, James, um, with Keane O'Neill. All of that, that organisation, tailored plans. And again, this is like 10 years ago. So he, Martin Kennedy was absolutely spectacular for us. Like every one of the lads, he was just brilliant individually, like the time and effort that he would put in. Exactly what you're kind of making the point. See, nothing was thrown in. Everything had a purpose and everything had a purpose for each player. Now, it takes a lot of time for a coach to, to develop that and to build that for 35 guys. But that's, for me, Martin Kennedy was, was massive. And then we lost him to the IRFU. I think he, he's involved with the under-20s and underage systems there. So that was a massive loss. And we were kind of struggling to replace him, him as well. But then we, we got Brian Cullen in, who was, we, we were blessed that Cully could come in, had the, the academics. He'd worked with Leinster Rugby as well. But he also had the credibility to, to replace mm-hmm. Martin because he played with us. He, he was an all Ireland winning captain as well. So it's such a massive part. And who did your team. who did your football coaching mostly? Oh, well, that's that's why I was saying they did not get involved in the football at all. So who was in the football? We would have had Declan Darcy was just an absolute legend for, for, for our group. Uh, brilliant player, obviously. And he was kind of doing our defensive side of things. And then we had different forwards coaches throughout. We, we, had, we had a couple of guys. Mick Bahan was with us for a year. He was a brilliant technical coach. Uh, and then he went on and was obviously had incredible success with the ladies. And then we had J.O. For, for, for three or four years as well. And, and J.O. J.O. was brilliant as well. Just his personality, his own experience as, as a forward. He, as a player, would have to think his way through games. He didn't have the physical attributes. And you always find guys like that where, nearly like Andy, or you're talking about Andy, where he wasn't the fastest or, or things like that. You have to think your way. How can I impact the game? And you just have a different view of how the game is played. And J.O. was brilliant for us as well. So like we were very fortunate that, that we had guys like that. To Okay, we had some really good players, obviously, but one, those players were open to learning, but we had the coaches who, who could really add value to us as well. But, but there was always a distinct thing with us that the strength conditioning guy, whether it was Martin Kennedy or whether it was Cully, would, uh, would do that. And that was it. Mm. Football was left to, to, to someone else. So it's interesting to hear someone like Keane O'Neill kind of take, take the whole lot. Because um, you can kind of get caught between two stools, maybe, I would have thought. Or, but look, he, he seems to have an incredible reputation with every group he's been with. The consensus is this guy is is top of the class, really. And in terms of what Keane O'Neill could bring to Galway, James, like when we, when we talk about Galway, we often look at the mercurial. Well, maybe mercurial is, is unfair. Shane Walsh is their most talented footballer, like hands down, one of the most talented footballers in the country. When you see what he did at the weekend to Cork, and he left Matty Taylor for for dust, as we saw, and buried that goal. It was just awesome to watch, and he's done things like that, freakishly impressive things on a Gaelic football pitch, but maybe just not consistently enough. Do you think that Keane O'Neill would go in and be able to positively influence Shane Walsh's career and bring him on to that next level that he needs to get to? I do. I do. I think that Keane would have gone in there with that in mind, with Shane Walsh in mind even, and trying to get an extra bit out of him. Um, and he, did, he enjoys taking on kind of the, the big players and the big personalities and trying to to drag more out of them, do you know. I think that I think that Shane Walsh will will have got a boost out of out of Keane going in there. Okay. But like I like uh, through the grapevine, I heard over the last year or two that training in in Galway wasn't spectacular. So it did need what? to go in there. Who's so, called it? Name names. Jimmy <laughs> sources. Episode one. Who's your sources, Jimmy? Yeah, Can't reveal them. Joyce, he's got me looking for you, Jimmy. Mayo fella told me. <laughs> well, Lauren, well, wasn't. <laughs> But like you, you can have the best players in the world. If the training is not absolutely exceptional, you, you mightn't get there at all, you know. So mm. I think the key and will have a lot to say there. But we were in when we were in um, we were in Portugal one time, and we did, we had kind of a meeting. We were after losing to to the boys in in 2013. We kind of ran out of steam in the second half, so we said we weren't fit enough. <laughs> <laughs> Biggest mistake of all time. And we said to, <laughs> we said to Keane that um, it was actually Aidan Mahoney that said to him, look, 
the training is unreal, but we want to do the kind of old fashioned long runs as well. Just wow. if nothing else for the head. So he said, no bother, lads. And I swear to God, we went back training. We did some sickening stuff. 800 meters, 600 meters, 400 meter races. No sign of a ball. It was like, it was like he, he took a person that, that Mahoney had said that we weren't fit enough. I'd say and he just hammered us with long runs. But, um, but you know like, what? It, it, it's funny. Like Teams probably do need one or two of them a season. They need yeah. to be... Like sports science has been... I love sports science, lads, because I, I took a lot of that stuff out. It was great. Managing the load was one of my favourite <laughs> phrases. Burn it. It was beautiful. Now, we're doing a bit much there. We need to take it easy tonight. Do a skill session. But, but um, some of this drive me mad, some of those, some of those coaches, because they've read it in a book, but yeah. they haven't actually experienced it. They haven't weighed the two sides of it up, do you know? Like yeah, you, I, 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 I think there's a place stuff. in every season for teams to kind of go to the well. Like yeah. this is, we're going to do a hard week here, and it's going yeah. to be a bit old school. But just for the group to kind of come through that, and I like, like, I don't really agree with what Manny was saying. Just have it in your head that, that we've gone here, and you're crawling off the pitch, and like Deck Darcy wasn't a great man for that. <laughs> he was old school and, and came through as a brilliant player with Leitrim and, and Dublin and my own club, St. Bridget's through the 90s, like where that was the done thing. That was the only thing that was really done and the sports science had not come into GAA at that point. So we, even ourselves, as would have taught of ourselves, is very scientific and analytical in how we approach the season. There was always space for a couple of those where, sessions. Where, did, where, did, way. where would you have gone for that? Because it's never, I've uh, like, I'm a mead man, so I'm going to re- recall it, remember it, but reading books and listening, reading Nilla columns. Tara, that one. Not the Hill of Tower, the Sand Dunes in Betty's Town. Bernie yeah, Flynn right. has written about getting sick into the Sand Dunes, hiding in other Sand Dunes, trying to, like Sean Boylan's torturous runs in those winter months, where I think he was building a mental resilience. And the game, yeah. sure, was slightly different back then. But it's interesting you say that, James, that now Manny is somebody that clearly doesn't shy away from training anyway. He's probably one of those people who loves training and, and, and going away. He was looking but, for torture. He probably was looking for torture. The fellow is yeah. probably still at it too. So did you find that helped then? Because obviously 13, you fall short. Yeah. 14, you win it, the All-Ireland. 15, you get to the All-Ireland final once more. So did that help? Well, I, I, I presume the Keynes plan was kind of a, it wasn't just a 12-month plan. Mm. He would have said, I'm coming in here for two or three years and you're going to be on an upward curve. And by yeah. 14 and 15, you'll be at your peak. Do you know, I, I'd imagine that's what he would say. But... I did definitely get a bit of benefit from it, but as for the rest of his training, that was the top notch. Like, you know, there okay. was always it was always so sharp for the inside forwards. There was never anything, as we said, that wasn't needed. Mm. But in Galway, right, they're training. They have probably the right man in charge in terms of the way they're going to play. They're going to play open, aggressive football. They have a great trainer, Owen Keane. But what they're probably missing is two or three very tight markers at the back like if if they come up against a team with maybe two or three scoring forwards they might be they might be fine but i think if they come up against a team with five six scoring forwards i don't think they have enough backs to cover all of them so i just wonder what they're going to do with that side of things i think that mayo might actually suit them in connacht because Mm -hmm. mayo kind of don't have those five or six constant threats so not many teams do, James. But it's, yeah, that's it's it. Is Kerry part. are Kerry the only team you'd be worried about in that regard at the moment? When Dublin get the boys back, Kerry do. That's Kerry's thing at the moment. They have forwards and they're kicking the ball. Mm. So that's the only thing about Galway. I think if they 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 have actually history of playing forwards in the full back line. Do you know, like so, I just wonder what they'll do there. They need to get a marquee fella and yeah. another two with them. Well, they've to they've had all the threats. They've conceded. A huge amount of scores, do you and know? That's and, in then, Division two. and they have so. like they're obviously playing quite an open side, but they've had quite a similar, um, settled full back line for a lot of those games as well. Sean Kelly, Liam Silk, and Kieran Malloy, all three of them are so good at going forward, too. Yeah, yeah. You know? oh, you played them all in the half back line. <laughs> Say that again, <laughs> you played them all in the half back line. Yeah, you usually would. And Kelly can play with the they had Johnny Heaney. I think I marked Johnny Heaney cornerback, he was cornerback one time. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he's a wing forward. Mm-hmm. 
So they like they they're going one way and it's forward. But like if if Offaly can get three goals against them, and mm-hmm. Offaly wouldn't even be in the top twelve probably, then you would fear for them at the back. Yeah, but well, that, you can see the five goals in the last two games. Cork got two in them as well. That was a big thing from Kevin Walsh would have identified that in his style, and it was like, right, let's be compact, let's be hard to play against. I thought they had reasonable success in that. The lads come in, change the coaches, the players are kind of like, oh, we don't really like playing this style, it doesn't suit our players. We'd be more expansive. Like everyone, we'd all love to play 15 on 15. But it, it, the, the realistic option there for why do teams play blanket defences? It's to protect our defenders. Mm-hmm. If, if they said we have the six best defenders, let them deal one-on-one no matter who we're playing against. Very few teams have that luxury, and that's why you're, you're bringing players back. It's to kind of protect, protect your weak links in, in a way. Like, and that's if Galway aren't going to do that, they're saying, and it's a brave thing to do, it's a brave way to play. Go, look, we're going to play 15 and we're going to go out, and it's going to be a shootout. Do Mayo play quite a similar way? Mayo do, yeah, Mayo do because you know, Mayo have brilliant backs. But Mayo are more defensive minded. Like they're yeah. defensive. But Mayo had brilliant defenders. Forward line. Yeah. Yeah, they, they do. But even they, they were backing their lads to the others. Yeah. You some of the best one on one markers in the game when they were playing like that. Yeah. So and, and that's if they didn't, with James Horn has been as flamboyant as his style as there. Maybe not the right word for James Horn, but would they have played that style if yeah. they didn't have total confidence in Keith Higgins and Colin Boyle and Donny Vaughan and Lee Keegan and these guys so it, it's a tricky one um, yeah. will they tweak it can they tweak it that's why it's hard to get an exact read on it because Division 2 look just the facts of it it's not the top end but they play what's common and Derry in the next couple of weeks yeah. that'll give you more insight into it and like I say it's such an open season it's an opportunity for these teams and we were crying out for it we said it in our first podcast Give us two or three teams that can push into that bracket and start competing, provincial titles and being in the All Ireland series. And what we've seen to date, and you can only go off that, is they are without a doubt on the right track. But bigger tests lie ahead, and 100%. you get a proper proper insight then and the impact Keen O'Neill has, and what's their style of play going to be against against the top teams, and can Shane Walsh? There's never ever ever any doubt about his quality, mm. his athleticism, his talent. I want to see Shane Walsh when the, when the game's on the line. And it's, what's, how's the decision-making going to come in then? Because he has everything else. Yeah, I'd be excited to see it. I'd be backing him to do it this year. I think I think we're going to see a lot from him this year. Yeah. So just like even their spread of scores at the weekend was impressive. They are so impressive going forward and they have such an array of attacking quality. Walsh didn't score, as I said. Conroy turns up with two points. Sean Kelly is like bombing forward all the time. And he's probably lining out in different positions. He scored 1-1 even though he lined out a cornerback. Matty Tierney kicked three points from the half forward line. Rob Finnerty scored four points inside. Damien Comer scored one three. So like, go away are getting scores from across the board. Um, again, it's Division Two, so it'll be interesting to see where that goes. As you said, Paddy, next game up for Galway is Clare. After that, they're playing Derry, which is going to be a cracker. And after that, the final league game is a way to us common. So, I think we'll we'll move on here to chat about some of the other games this weekend. It is a massive weekend in the National Football League. It's it's round five. We're going to start seeing teams consigned to relegation, promotion, and the league finals now in the next couple of weeks or in the next week. Say it's going to tell a, a huge story. So in Division One, we've got Armagh Kildare in the Athletic Grounds. We've got Kerry Mayo in Austin Stock Park. We have Donegal Monaghan in Bally Buffet, and we've got Tyrone up against Dublin in Healy Park. In Division Two, um, I'll actually run through the tables as well. But in Division Two, it's Down Offaly in Park Esther. It's Galway Clare in Pierce Stadium, Mead are playing Cork and Park Talton, massive game for both counties as we mentioned, and it was coming up against Derry in the Hyde, so Division 1 just to give you it, as it looks, it's, it's Kerry and Mayo sitting at the top, they're both sitting pretty, 7 points apiece in the next tier below them, Armand and Donegal are both on 5 points, they'll both giving themselves a chance with a win at the weekend to get into that final position Kalair are on 3 points, Tyrone are on 3 points, Monaghan are 2 points and Dublin are 0, so uh, massive weekend across the board in Division 1. Division 2, Derry are on 8 points. Galway are on 8 points. Derry are on top with their superior score difference. Roscommon are just behind them on 7. Their draw with Clare has left them there. Clare are in 
fourth position in Division 2. Clare have drawn with both Cork and Roscommon. They've got their one win and they've been beaten as well. So they're on four points. Mead are on two points. The top of the, the worst teams in Division 2. So they're on two points, two draws. Cork are on one point. Down are on one point, And Offaly are on one point. So Down Offaly and Mead and Cork at the weekend are two games we're keeping an eye on in Division 2. They have a lot riding on them. In Division 3, Wicklow, three wins out of four, are top at six points. Antrim are there on five points. Fermanagh are on five points. Louder on five points. And Westmead are on four points. So you've got five teams there that are going to be backing themselves to get into Division 2 next year. A lot to play for there. Leash are on three. Longford are on three. And Wicklow look consigned to Division 4. They're on one point. So it's Antrim up against Longford. Fermanagh up against Loud. Limerick up against Westmead. And Wicklow against Leash this weekend in Division 3. Then down in Division 4, Cavan are leading the way. Four wins from four. Cavan are doing as you'd expect in Division 4 yeah. this year. Um, they're holding off teams by an average of four or five points. That's Sligo by six at the weekend. Sligo have been going relatively well. Um, and then just beneath Cavan, the teams that are vying for that second promotion position, London, one of the stories of the league so far, on six points. Tipperary have got the show back on the road in the last two weeks with two big wins. They're on five points. Sligo are on four. Leitrim are on four. And down near the bottom, we've got Wexford and Carlow on two points and Waterford on one. So the Division 4 games this weekend is Sligo against London and Markovich Park. Carlow up against Leitrim, Cavan against Tip, and Wexford up against Waterford. So they're the games. As we mentioned earlier, there's five games on TV this weekend. There wasn't a single one on last weekend. It was a Hurling weekend, to be fair. And the Hurling was pretty decent to give them their due. But this weekend, we've got Armagh there on TV on Saturday. And Kerry against Mayo is the featured game on Saturday evening. James, are you excited for Kerry Mayo on Saturday? Are you looking forward to this one? Will you make it over to Trulli? I will. Stack Park will be buzzing Saturday night. Mm. In fairness to Mayo, they'll bring a great atmosphere. And Kerry fans are starting to get a bit excited now. You know, they're starting to play well. Good brand of football. Mayo will be a big test. You know, if you can get over Mayo there, you know you're going in the right direction. And Mayo probably will put pressure on themselves to come down and get a result. We spoke before about certain fixtures kind of being worth more than a win. A win for Mayo away in Tralee would be massive, massively. You can't understate that. So I think that it's going to be unbelievable atmosphere down there. It'll be a great brand of football, but the pressure is probably going to be a bit more on Kerry, but I expect them to, to come out on top. It's interesting that you say that because Horan, even when he was going up against Dublin and Crow Park and he could have said the same thing, Horan made a number of changes. He made a lot of changes for that game. Uh, he wasn't afraid to try a few different things. True, but there is a stage. There's a stage in the league where you have to you have to go at what yeah. you what you have. You have to say right now. Let's see how we're fixed. It would be. I think it would be a waste for him to go with a team that he doesn't think is going to be his team in championship. It would be a waste of a chance. You know, even if he plays his strongest team against Kerry, they get beat by six points. Just say he can go in and say right. This is what happened. We can improve it. We'll be better for the championship. But if he goes and he plays kind of a, a semi-strong team, what are you going to learn from it? Yeah. You know, it I'd rather like, you put your best team out. It felt like both our man Mayo when they faced each other last week nearly had this secret deal where they were both trying out a few different things. Like Kieran McGinney put Eaton Rafferty in goals, who would be a midfielder and a forward mostly, and his first appearance for the county in goals. Um, Horan picked Sam Callanan, who's still doing his leaving cert, to start yeah. his first league game at wing back. And then, as we mentioned last week, Mayo strength and depth that come off the bench that day was so impressive. Paddy Durkin, Potter Gohora, Aidan O'Shea, Kevin McLaughlin, and then Jack Carney and, and Fergal Bowling come on as well. But there was, you know, huge strength in that Mayo team off the bench the last day. So that was interesting. Frank Irwin started that day and got a first league start. So uh, Carrier that's interesting. Down a few. Carrier down. Dan O'Donoghue has a, a calf injury cornerback. I'm not sure. Has he going. impressed you? Yeah, he's been very solid. Yeah, I thought he's been good in the What's he, he bringing to the table? He brings a bit of nastiness yeah. in the in the full back line. He has a bit of a bit of a kind of a mouth in a good way. You know, he'll talk he'll talk his defenders through the game, but he'll kind of talk to his man as well. Um, and there's going to be a matchup for him in every game. He matched up well with Rock, um, you know, against Mayo. A Killian O'Connor there would be a great matchup for him. Someone like that. He mightn't be the paciest, but he's strong and he's tuned in and he's good defensive mindset and he got up against uh, he got up for a point against Donegal he got up for a great score he captained East Kerry last year with, with Clifford the two Cliffords on the team is he a Clarny boy as well? 
Yeah, he'd be what sp- club? He'd be Spa Club, which would be Clarny, just outside Clarny, but it'd be it'd be classed as Clarny. Okay. Um, he'd be he's been knocking around for a while. He deserved his chance. Um, what age did you? Know? I'd say he's he had Jack with the twenty one, so he must be he must be twenty five. Oh. Must be a good twenty five. Um, mm. so he's been around a while. Um, but he yeah he is a county championship under his belt. He's played in big games. It was a it was a no brainer to throw him in. But Kerry are down Paul Murphy with a hamstring, and they're down Gavin White with a hamstring. So there's a chance for someone in the backs there to come in and and play in a big game against Mayo. Dan O'Donoghue is 26 this year. I'm just looking at a, a player profile on spaga.com. You can go Google it. I don't think it's safe for me to read out most of the answers here. Uh, <laughs> his nickname is Gugu for some reason. Favourite toy as a child was a pool, was a pool table. Um, yeah, I don't know. Best player you've ever played against? Brian Reap from Mayo. Um, wonder will that change after this season? So there's a yeah, I don't know if I can read out many of these. So go Google Dan O'Don who's player profile on the Spa GA uh website. <laughs> That's an interesting one. He's he's definitely one of the players that Jack has brought to the table this year. And it's interesting you say that he's bringing that bit of rawness or roughness in defense too. Mm. Did you feel that was lacking? I suppose you only you only know what you didn't have when you get something new in. You kind of go, Do you know what that actually probably was needed a bit of a bit of rough um rough and tumble, just a bit of bit of strength back there. But he he's different kind of physique to an ordinary cornerback. He's kind of stockier, stronger, more physical. Um as opposed to Tom Sullivan would probably be lighter, um, maybe a bit smaller. And Jason would be kind of tall but lean. They, they're kind of a, a nice mix in there now with Tom mm-hmm. Sullivan, Jason Foley and, and Dan Dunhill. But Sounds there's a like- chance for someone else there this weekend because if Dan is out someone's going to come in there and be marking a top player and you have a chance there to, to say, I can do it on a big day. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, we have a question in here, James. I might just put it to you now instead of saving it for later. What is the most notable difference between Peter Keane and Jack O'Connor's carry? It's very early days, but has anything else stood out to you? Kicking the ball. It's very political here now, Jamesy. Watch your step here. No, no he's no, answering no, there. Hold it, on. Go it's on. Ki- kicking the ball. Okay. Peter had, Peter had it down, but... There was times where we didn't move the ball fast enough. Whereas I can imagine Jack inside is just saying, "Move it, move it, move it." And I could actually see it against Dublin. There was one stage where we were coming out the right half back position, and usually we'd have nearly turn back, kind of hit a bit of traffic, and maybe gone a hand pass backwards. But I could just tell that Jack did not want that. And the number twelve, the half forward on the other side. Had to make a diagonal run to receive a kick pass, kind of diagonal kick pass slash down the line. And it was just that that unbelievable hard run from the wing forward over to the other side starts an attack and gets you out. And mm. I don't think that the Kerry were doing that over the last um, year or two. But I think that there's going to be such an emphasis on it now, it's, it's going to improve them. And in terms of getting a message that- across to a squad, that can't just be a throwaway comment that we're going to kick it more lads clearly that has to be drilled into them uh, every possible chance he gets he's going to say kick it and if it doesn't happen in training he's going to stop training up he's going to say lads that has to be kicked and he's going to say it in a nice calm way but then you'll know that look if you kick it and you lose it this is the way we're going with it yeah. but the benefits of it for Kerry if you're kicking the ball to the two Cliffords to Sean Shea, to Paul Ganey why would you not do that? Why would you be hand passing the ball around midfield or the half back line? But wasn't that a, that style had just crept in conservatism and, and cutting out mistakes that had creeped in across the board two or three years? Dublin, look, we've spoken about it so much. Challenges they face, Kerry were in the same boat as well. Where it was, I could force a kick down the line here, but. Why? Why not just turn and let's keep possession? Let's not give away a turnover. Because that phase for two or three years, that's what was working. Particularly like what we touched on it. You're playing the, the Ulster teams, the Thrones, the, the Donegals. They were thriving off turnovers. So Dublin, we we got away from probably being more direct and kicking the ball. Um, like I said, the Ulster teams didn't really do it either. Kerry were getting away from it as well. And there's definitely a trend over the last kind of 18 months where that is coming back into the game. It's way better to watch, way more exciting. There's more mistakes because you're probably forcing kick passes. But 
if you've got the guys inside, get it in. As, as raw or as basic as that m- might seem, that seems to be a trend where, where teams, we've seen it with Armagh, lighten the league up so far. Let's kick the ball in. Let's be more direct. And Dublin are crying out for that, that type of attack and threat. But Kerry, you can see with Jack out there, without a doubt, it's an influence. And the comments from the Kildare game in Newbridge, mm. where, where they don't do that in the second half, they, they get away with a draw, possibly could have lost that game to their Dublin game in Tralee. His comments were chalk and cheese after that. It was like, we stopped kicking the ball. And you could see he was fuming about it. Because it, look, it's Kerry Reese, traditionally, they're a kicking team. They've got brilliant players who can do that. And they've got the weapons inside. Why would you not? Yeah. I, I find this interesting because like, the GA is, is obviously across the board, club level, county level, cross codes is incredible for copycat culture. Where <laughs> a certain team will set a template or play a certain style and club managers naturally across the board will try and implement it into the system. Like the bloody horseshoe. I don't know if the horseshoe was used in your own vernacular in, in, in but it was, it was an infestation from North Never Beans, Monaghan. No, it was when the ball would go into a corner forward and you'd horseshoe it back across to the other side. But you were basically <laughs> guarding the ball to bring it back. Oh, it used to, it used to just turn my soul black inside the horseshoe and there was a time and a place for it where you keep the ball and you keep possession Paddy I'm sure you, you had you must have had something like the horseshoe we did it like. for three or four years straight we didn't and, call it the horseshoe now but okay but you, you you were the best in the business of doing it and you had set the standard but when it's copied down the board the mm. level of quality and the implementation it takes it ends up teams suffer because of it but when I'm hearing yeah, James that, like, James you started off this pod tonight with it what's the next innovation Mm. But what coach or what team is going to come in? Because you're right, like it's it's the blanket defence comes in and lots of teams copy it. Then it's but all you think the football has got fast. Then with Dublin's success, we had teams were modelling themselves off us and we were the more pragmatic style and, and more probably risk averse. That seems to be gone from the game now. That That's probably not going to get you over the line. What's the next team or the next coach that's going to come in and say, and do something where we're all shocked? It's probably it's, happening. It's probably happening before our eyes, do you know? It's probably is happening at the minute and it'll start making itself clear. But J- Paddy, would you think that because after the blanket defences, so teams obviously roll back on kicking the ball again, but now yeah. we're moving back towards that side, would you feel like the quality of kicking has improved across the board because it probably needed to to get past blanket defences for a while or whatever stage? Would you feel like it has? Like, I don't know. I, I'd nearly feel like the, the quality of kick passing has had to improve over the last couple of years. Well, it, it's, it's something you... If you're a coach coming in, you're kind of, what players have we got with disposal? What are their best skills? Because, like I say, if you're coming to senior inter-county and you're nearly coaching guys how to kick, that's, that's not really a recipe for success. And that's why I would always have said, you look at, at a Kerry team, that's their tradition. That's never going to be an issue for them. So that should always form the basis of how they, how they should play. It'd be very similar, I'd say, with Galway that these guys have got really talented footballers. So what game plan is easiest for these guys to implement? Um, the best teams, of course, would be able to mix it up, that they'll be able to adapt to whatever the opposition are doing. But I think you see that in the summertime, in Crow Park in particular, there is lots of space there. It's a fast track. The teams that generally have done well there, you need to have that in your army. So it, players and coaches need to focus on that in their training. And it, it's funny you say what Keane O'Neill's kind of background and what he would focus a lot on as technical and as scientific it is going to be, a lot of it was based around skills. And I remember we didn't have many people come and watch us training with Dublin because we, we would like to kind of keep it very much in-house. But any guests or visitors that might have come in for, for a night to watch us, they were always surprised at what they perceived as how basic our training could be mm. in terms of skills. You go, here's the, this Dublin team who are winning games after game and winning championship after championship. They were expecting some off-the-wall training. Like, what are these guys doing? What's the secret sauce? And we, if you look from the outside, we, we were pretty basic in terms of our training skills. It was nail the skills. Catch, kick, scoring, defenders doing blocks. <laughs> like, literally... Nothing overly scientific, but do those things incredibly well and do them off. And that 
pretty much when it comes into a championship game, it's nearly second nature. And, and I think but the higher up the game you go, the more convoluted it can become and the more we need to be, we need to be nearly too smart for our own good. And the tactics and all the type of thing, yes, they are mm. important, but ultimately the skills that teams have, we put massive, massive emphasis on, on that. And that was a key part of our success. And it's, it's funny, James, you saying that with Keane O'Neill, that's, that's a big focus of him as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think if you have, fair enough, you have the, the basics in training, constant repetition of the simple stuff, right? Yeah. Hugely important. And then you start off your season, just say with a kicking philosophy. And it mm. might be a bit goopy at the start. It might be great but you make a lot of mistakes. But as you go on, the receiver is making better runs. Your passing is getting better from the training and suddenly it clicks into a bit of gear. Mm. So like it might take a while. You might lose a few games, but if you're building that kind of philosophy, it's worth it. And as well, if a team thinks that you're going to kick the ball every time, they have to defend in a certain way, which allows you to run it more than as a result. Mm. Whereas if they think that, oh, they're just going to run it, then they're going to sit back off you and there's never going to be a kick on. I think if you have the if you have the defense in so much fear that you're going to move the ball fast, it opens up the other channels of attack, and it did it did for E. Like every time E slowed it down, because there was always a threat of the ball inside, it kind of pulled defenders in to cover that, and then the channels might be open for yeah. late yeah, runners. Or, yeah, that's, what I mean, like, that's the the best teams. You need to be able to do both. Yeah. Like, you can't just hang your hat on. This is our style of play, and it's really exciting, and it's brilliant because, again, supporters, players, we'd all love to kick the ball all the time, and it's really fast, and it's really open. You've got to have more strings to your ball. And if you look at our All-Ireland champions now, as case in point, spent a lot of the National League last year, and it was like, there's a new style from Tyrone. So that the, the guys have come in and, and maybe got away from Mickey Hart's more draconian style of play and it's let's move the ball quicker and we were praising them they get a bit of a beating in Killarney and, and judging by the end particularly you get to the Ulster final and the all Ireland semi-final against Kerry and the throne are like it's nearly like they've gone back in time they're playing really defensively and shutting teams down but they had the ability to be able to do both mm-hmm. and the best teams can do that and you're going to need to do that and, and that's why as good as Galway have been to date you say it's really free flowing they're racking up big scores Will that style alone get them to win an All-Ireland and, and beat two or three of the biggest teams? Probably not. They need to be able to do the other things. And as Kerry, I've said it, and, and you can only go on the evidence over the last couple of years, when it's kick pass and when it's free flow and Kerry are as good as anyone, they're brilliant. But I think they've struggled in games where that option is, is taken away from them. And they haven't been able to master those tight spaces and those packed defences and not get their key guys on the ball because the kick pass has been shut off. So you need to be able to do both. You need to be able to mix it up. We're saying Dublin on the other side have been so entrenched in terms of, of kind of slow build-up play, methodical. They need to get back to add that more expansive and more risk to their, to their attack and play, or they're not going to get, get over the line. So teams need to have two or three different options. Um, but... In terms of what, what you'll see at the weekend between two teams, it's an exciting game. They're two of probably the best teams in the country at the minute in terms of what we've seen so far to date. And they play that expansive style. So you're hoping, fingers crossed, this may be the first weekend of the National League where it's not gale force winds or hurricanes or lashing rain and Kerry and Mayo get a decent evening in Tralee. 100%. Because it, it could be a brilliant game to watch. Yeah. And a very interesting one to watch because you're going to get a sense as we come into true March of, as James has said, teams are edging towards championship form because it's just around the corner. Yeah. No, that's really looking forward to that one. And then you've got three games on Sunday. Donegal, Monaghan, Mead, Cork, Tyrone, Dublin. Paddy, if I give you a choice to pick one, surely you're not going to watch the Dubs getting beaten again. Which game would you pick? It was a great weekend last weekend. They, they weren't beaten for the first time this year. It was great. They bet Mead in Navin. And the ladies, yeah. The ladies won. Hannah Bad Turrell with a buzzer. Hurlers, but... Uh, I'm actually up in Belfast this weekend, so I don't know if I get to see many of the games live. But um, okay. Dublin can I go think down. That, that's a hard game for Dublin to go to, to Healy Park. So um, if they lose and Kildare get a point, Dublin are down. But yeah, Dublin, are, Dublin are down if they lose, aren't they? 
Oh, maybe, 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 maybe yeah, mathematically. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a big game for them. Look, every game for, for, for most teams now through March is going to be a big game, whether it's relegation or promotion or you're, yeah. you're getting towards championship time. But for Dublin in particular, it's it's a hard place to go. Healy Park at our best. We found the tough going up there. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what sort of players are getting game time, if any of the more established guys are getting back from injury. Um, Tyrone will be kind of smarting from the way they lost that game to Donegal, having controlled it for, for basically 40, 45 minutes. Um, they'll be looking to get back on track again. So um, Will Con be back? Will James be back? That's what, that's what James Donahue wants to know. Will James McCarthy or Conor Conor be know, back? Have not even been in squads? Will you not give the footpod listeners the heads up first? That's all we ask. If I knew. What I know, you guys will know. But, but I, I would say, have not even been in squads yet to go straight back into the team, I'd be surprised. Mm. Um, they could do with them. Yeah, it would be yeah. great if they were there, but that's going to be a, a, a tough Big one ask. for Dublin. They'll be named anyway. <laughs> I think <laughs> I'll be named. <laughs> Better the weekend is at least one red card in that game. Oh, I yeah. would say there's... <laughs> There's be probably careful. a chance that that's can you bet? Be can you bet in a brawl? A yeah. tunnel brawl. A tunnel. I'd brawl. expect that there will first. be something. Yeah. Well, it generally is Dublin from uh, up and on, yeah. it, It's going to be a box office weekend of action. Just on the the Mead Dublin game in Navan. So there's a lovely rivalry brewing there. Yeah. Finally, again between Mead and Mead and Dublin. But Hannah Tyrrell wins a free on the buzzer. She took her shot from the top of the D. And by the time she takes her free, Tom O'Connor, a football pod listener, sent this in to me. By the oh. time she takes her free, she's nearly on the 21. Well, yeah. I'd, be, I'd be a fan of sneaking a couple of yards if you're taking a free or mark. James, would you have done the same, taking frees? Oh, 100%. Mm. Yeah. You can yeah, any any spot, and next thing you, you ignore that completely <laughs> and change your trajectory of the run so you just steal about 10 yards. Yeah, would it not be the linesman who'd be calling you out in that, no? And yeah, it'd be the linesman's little so job. It's so rare that they actually do that. Really? Yeah. It's up to the ref. It's looking, but yeah. look, I'd say if it's literally on the final kick of the game, the ref should probably be on top of that. Mm. You can kind of get caught up in, in the middle of the half or anything like that. But if it's a point to win the game yes. in injury time, the ref or linesman should probably be on that. Or the me players should be screaming that this is happening. Yeah. Um, and what about... Play to Hannah Tyrrell and a great kick and a big win for them. Yeah. So, that's kind of the benefit of taking free out of your hands as well, isn't yeah. it? You know, as opposed to off the ground, you can kind of steal those extra extra yards. Five yards. You can nearly take, five um, yards out of it. You can nearly yeah. take an AFL run-up. Two hundred steps. And punt kick it then with the laces. <laughs> punt it over, yeah. Do you see uh, do you see Roberto Carlos is back playing soccer at the weekend for some non-league team? You, you see, see this, though? Uh, some pub team, yeah. Did you see him lining up? Probably getting a few quid for that. Do you see him lining up to take the free kick? No. Oh, jeez. I'll, I'll have to send you the clip. He nearly were... dislocated his hip. <laughs> he scored a penalty, though. Yeah, he did, yeah. They were trying to react. He, he, he's wintered well, hasn't he? He has. He's enjoyed definitely. retirement. Those Brazilian lads knew how to party, though. They yeah, definitely did, yeah. Fun. In fairness, that's that's one. We might have to get Paul Walsh back on the show to talk about that trip down to Ronaldinho, the Kerry Afro superstar who made his way over to, <laughs> to meet the Ronaldinho. That was some story. We had him on AM talking about that a few months ago. Okay, we have a couple of questions in, lads. Uh, we're nearly finished this week's episode of The Football Pod with Paddy Andrews and James O'Donoghue. Have you done your homework? That is the big question. I asked yeah. you to write down on a piece of paper TJ Dahani, Dahini Dahani, I think the leash name, TJ's question. Can you ask the lads who are the top three players in the country on form? James, can I get your first selection? Yeah. I have it on my phone. Hang on. Do you want to see it? Can't see with the light. Can't see. Oh, I don't see oh, it. No, wait. Here we go. Here. Oh, interesting. Okay, well, talk us through number one. These finish. aren't in. These aren't in order. Okay, give us your first name. My first one is Shane Walsh because, in fairness, he is different gravy at the moment. Some of the scores he's racking up, he's doing big numbers. He's clearly in phenomenal shape, and he's a leader for Galway. You know, he's, he is a standout player. Everything he does just seems to be top quality at the moment. If he can bring the right mentality to the championship, he'll have a big, big say in it. Top scorer in Division 2 at the minute with 220 so far. And he didn't even score at the weekend. So that is an interesting one. Top scorer from play with 1-6. Paddy, who's your first selection? Uh, Reno O'Neill. You definitely didn't write these down. Did I? No, not a chance. <laughs> I've had to think of my toes here again. 
Oh, you forgot when you rang me earlier. Uh, I'm busy, lads. It's you're not terrible. easy, lads. It's not All easy. Right. Rain O'Neill definitely is in. And I'm going to throw a few curveballs in here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There'll be two dubs anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Conor Callahan. <laughs> no, uh, Rain O'Neill. Dermot O'Connor. Yes. I've been impressed with I think he's been standout. He's and been it, class. It's, it's yeah, odd now because he's a lot of miles on the clock and Mayo traditionally haven't really been overly focused on the league. And you particularly look at what they're doing with, with guys like Aidan O'Shea and Kevin McLaughlin and stuff, easing them back in. Whereas Dermot O'Connor's been there from the start and he's always in phenomenal shape. His athleticism is off the, off the charts, but he's been a massive player for Mayo so far. Uh, so I'd have him in it on current form, Reno O'Neill, and then you're looking at one of the Kerry guys, probably Shawnee Shea. Okay. Over Clifford. Clifford's an easy one to put in. I know he didn't. He, he's obviously tied up with Sigerson over the last couple of weeks and probably hasn't played as much. He only came on against Duddy Gall, whereas Shawnee Shea, I think he's been top class yeah. so far. Um, they're probably on form. Those three honourable mentions, there's, there's, like I say, not much happening with the dubs. Shane Walsh is obviously shooting the lights out. Um, Duddy Gall. No real standout players for them at the minute. Same with Tyrone, they're easing their way back in. So I, I'd probably have those, those yeah. three. At the Look, do you know what? You you winged it, but good shouts. It's not bad. I pulled it out of the bag. Yeah. I'm with yours, I'd James. Shawnee. I'd Shawnee and I had I had Clifford. Right. And so Shawnee, Shawnee Shawnee has won 17 so far this year. Clifford just behind them. Clifford scored three eight from play. So um yeah, you weren't bad. looking. They're playing well. They're playing very well, and they're top of the league. I I was thinking. Ryan O'Donoghue, yeah, Dermot O'Connor. Then Highland and Flynn, probably just below that. They're not, they haven't hit their mm. peak yet, I don't think. Mm. Um, and if there was, like, if you had to put in a dub, in fairness to Kilkenny, he has kept the show yes. on the road for the boys. He's been, he's been decent, but not, not maybe his best yet either. I'd be sticking Samuel Roy in there, lads. He's been shooting the lights out for loud and Mickey Hart. I don't know if you... Remember, we didn't pick our score the weekend there last week, but he, mm. he had that wonder score. So yeah, down seven. in the lower division, Samuel Roy has won 29 scored so far. John Heston scored 120, scored five or six the weekend. Heston's again. scoring machine. Yeah. Sean Quigley had a sensational game for Fermana at the weekend, pulling the strings. He scored 320, 310 in Division 3. Long so go. He's flying. And in Division 4, Keith Byrne has kicked 30 points for Leitrim so far. Um you have a couple of other players there standing out. Connor Sweeney's still doing the job for tip as they're looking for promotion. So I think you've made some good calls there. Uh, any defenders standing out so far? Probably Tom Sullivan from Kerry has been, been very good so far in the league. Um, Dan O'Donoghue who's an interesting one you picked out. Tom, Tom is an outstanding player. It'd be interesting to see what they do with him because he can be that man marker mm. or sometimes what they do with him is leave him the free man. And he can do damage. So it's interesting to see what kind of role he's going to get. Um, if they were to play Galway, I could see him being the only one to match up to Shane Walsh, really, for pace. So he'll get, he'll get one he, of those He was jobs. absolutely phenomenal in the all Ireland semi-final last year on McCurry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. McCurry. To be fair to him. And McCurry was in red hot form, obviously. He still came up trumps towards the end of that game, McCurry. So, but... His first half display in particular, Thomas Sullivan was spectacular. Yeah. yeah. So I agree. He, he's top, he's top drawer. Ryan yeah. Hoolan from Calaire is, is another one to watch as well. He was sensational last week, Paddy. Kind of slept on him a little bit, but watching the game back, he had an unbelievable game for Calaire last weekend. So yeah. that's that was uh TJ's question in. Um Tom Kniff wants to know, and this can be a quick one. Tell us something. And this sorry, this is Tom Kniff, not the Mayo defender. I checked his Instagram profile. <laughs> he sent this question in on the football pod underscore GA Instagram page. Tell us something a defender would do that you absolutely hated. Oh, attack. Heartbreaking. Never really got in to talking or pulling and dragging. Never bothered me. But like you thought, so when a lad starts sprinting up the pitch, Paddy Durkin, remember, nightmares about this fella. And you're running after him. It's hard going. Never enjoyed that. Like You come on yeah. for McCarthy. Was it McCarthy got a black card in the 16 final and you kicked two points before half time? Yeah, it's a bit of class. Like. Nobody was marking you. It's too smart. They smart haven't a clue them. what to do with you. Andrews comes <laughs> on with a black card. Too smart for them, yeah. <laughs> One step wily old fox. They thought you came on corner back. <laughs> <laughs> Killing O'Connor was pointing out. Andy was meant to be marking me, I think. Oh, they marked yeah. me the second day, anyway. It wasn't as uh, productive. You won the penalty, didn't you? I did. That's what I was marking Dirk in the second day. Mm. 
That was a good battle that day. From the trow, and he just spread it up the pitch. And I was like, Jesus Christ, this is going to be a long day. Was he playing on the back? Yeah, they put him on me in the replay, yeah. He's he's done that a few times. Was he sticky? I was horrendous. He literally just spread it up the pitch. They they smelled a rat with me. They knew I wasn't going to be great going back that way. And uh, and they were right. (laughs) They'd win the pan out, to be fair. And would, like, there was a... Conor Myler was talking a wee bit after the All Ireland last year did a couple of interviews and he spoke about a couple of interactions with himself and Paddy Durkin and it was a nice bit of John going on where uh, Myler would have set up a score and had something to say to Durkin and Durkin had the same to say to him was there any of that going on with him would he, no. he like I remember one thing stands out to me I loved watching Lee Keegan play but there was one All Ireland final and apologies for not getting it right here but Paul Flynn comes off the bench in this All Ireland final it could be a semi-final 17 a 17 and the, it, the, the intensity of that game is so much yeah, Lee man. Keegan starts belting him, just starts belting him boxes in the back. Nobody's spotting it because it's carnage all over the pitch that day. Yeah, that and was the intensity was, was so insane. Where, yeah. Like Keegan could mix it up any which way he wanted to. Yeah. Uh, James, you were speaking about how good he was and how beggars believed that he wasn't one in Ireland yet. But so Durkin wasn't really into any of that, was he? No, even Keegan, like there was Keegan would be full on, like, but there, there was never really chat. Like, mm. I'm not surprised, like Myler and you playing Toronto is a different story. Like, there's a lot more chat. But uh, with Durkin now, no, no. okay, James, it'd be, it'd be physical. There was no two ways about yes. it. There was never any chat because like we didn't really react to it. Durham or maybe the he's, other time got a bit excited. But he studies psychology, I think, Paddy Durkin. So maybe See, he knew my kryptonite. Just make this fella run. He didn't there need to say it. There you go. He had done his prep beforehand. James, what's the worst yeah. thing a defender can do to you? It is. It is take you on a gander up the field. Realistically, that's the worst thing. Because you're going to come back down tired. And too. if they're cute, they're going to put a fresh fella who hasn't gone on that run on you. And your man then is taking a break. You so, kind of spoke about the dubs doing this to yeah, Gooch in 15 with Philly going on a ride up the field and then switching yeah, over. I think Philly just did that himself. That wasn't really a plan. Like, <laughs> he yeah. just wasn't yeah. arse defending. Like. In fairness, he did it to Aiden O'Shea in that semi-final replay as well where he scored 1-2 or was very influential in the second half. It was the same season, yeah. Jeez, yeah, it was. he had a big, See, he had a big all, that, all that the defender has to do there is create a big score and it's going to be in the forward's head yeah. for the rest of the game. Yeah. You know, Just yeah. one one big moment there. And then... You'll have the selector coming trot, in telling you. you to, yeah, you have to, yeah, or you have to trot all the way back down and you think that the whole stadium is watching. What? Is, James never tracked him there, no. Do you know? Yeah. So it, it is, <laughs> but the worst thing a defender can do is call four other fellas back around him. Ah, uh, yeah. And then you know he's, claim, you know he's claim that he's the tightest that. marker. You, you what do you mean? That. Talk to me about that. What do you mean? If so you've roasted, a, you've roasted if a you're fella. marking a fella and he's roaring at his mates to get back, mm-hmm. he's shitting himself. He's like, I can't deal with this fella. And he, he wouldn't say it that way, obviously, but if he's crying out, sweepers coming back and he's calling the midfielder and the wing forward, you know he's under severe pressure. You must love that, though. Oh, he'll, get the, you know he'll, he'll get the you know credit then. He'll get the credit, even though his his... Buddies are after doing all the work, mm. you know. But that's the thing about system versus one on one. Okay. Comes nothing else, where... nothing physical would have put you off, or no John, or there was nothing like Vinnie Jones and Gaza back in the back in the nineties. Don't know if you remember. I that think if if your if your man gets too physical, he he's going to tire himself out as well. It's the, the grappling is so tiring that any sort of a run, <laughs> then you, you're only a little fella as well, Jimmy. Exactly. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just picturing James in a in a Kerry post match video analysis session as the GPS stats are put up on the board and he's trying to argue his way to get the G- get the wrestling stats included. I was wrestling <laughs> all game. It was them Nachi McNamee, was it? Or Hamsey? All of them, yeah. They, no, they have it. <laughs> they have it don't they? I, do you know what I should have done? I should have worn a hat rate monitor so they could have seen that I was doing something. One of those whoop things, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you've you only covered 24 metres but his heart rate's through the roof I'll keep you updated the whoop did that to my head if anyone's wondering why I look like Harry Potter this Harry, week on the football Harry pod Potter there, yeah. um, Brian Kelly sent in a good question this is a good one I should have put this to you earlier on because we're going to finish I think on this one I'm saving two others this is, this is spicy so Brian's a mead man from the Colin Kills Club loving the podcast Tommy fair play to you and the lads can you ask the boys do they think that they'd have stuck at Intercounty as long as they did if they were from a weaker county? Both were regularly competing and winning provincial champions, playing in Crow Park and competing for All-Irelands. 
I am just fascinated by what keeps a lad from the smaller counties, say, a Waterford, a Wicklow, even Wexford coming back for more every year. I know they're competing at the highest level possible to themselves in their own county and where they're from, but I just can't see how the commitment can meet the reward in the current game. Up the kills. That's from Brian. Paddy, could you have done it if you were born 30 miles but, south in Wicklow? Probably not, no. <laughs> My honest opinion. No. Are you not in it for the love of the game? <laughs> EA Sports. <laughs> uh, what I have, it's, it's hypothetical. Yeah, probably not. I don't know. It's a massive ask. That's why, like we touched on it, on it, on it last year, and you've seen some of the retirements all, over the over the off season as well. Guys doing 10, 12, 15 years playing inter county football. That deserves massive, massive respect. But I, I don't think we're going to see more of that. Not, and not even in just the top teams. Definitely not in, in the so called smaller county. But even some of the, the top teams players are not going to give that commitment because it's, it's, it is all consuming, and there's n- the time that a player in Leitrim or Tipperary or whoever in Division Four there, they're still training three, four, five times a week, like Kerry or Mayo or Tyrone, and you don't get you don't get the coverage, you don't get the profile out of it as well, and and ultimately highly unlikely that you're going to get the rewards of a provincial medal or. or or an all Ireland medal or an all star things like that. So it's a massive ask and it deserves massive respect. But I, I, I think I'd be surprised if you're going to see these guys for, for 12, 15 years giving up that time because it's it's just getting harder and harder and harder. Um, and for me, I realise how fortunate I was to be be part of a Dublin team where we were right there at competing every every year and you realise how lucky you are. But would I personally have done it in, in a smaller county where, where you're not getting that kind of reward out of it probably not to be honest not for, I, not for the, the time I did maybe mm. four or five years but not 12, 13 years I don't think so but we definitely we had done a piece on off the ball in January 2020 and it's very difficult to get exact scientific comparisons on this but we had done a list of the amount of players that have stepped away and this is before the pandemic so stepped mm. away to go travelling or took a year out of football they were all players in their mid-20s and they were coming from counties like yeah. Cavan and Tip and the middle tier counties, the counties that didn't really have a shot at maybe winning the provincial or winning a getting to an All Ireland semi final, and I randomly came across a documentary, and I think I mentioned it recently as well here that I had done in college, where we did it on player burnout and the the state of play at that time. We'd interviewed Kenny Clark from Cavan and John Heston from Westmead, and myself and a friend Eamon Dunne who works in the Irish Times had done it, and Heston said, like, in what business? In what company, in what way of life would you train for nine months of the year to play three high-end championship games? Mm. And like, that was in 2012. And Heslin goes through 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, still playing Gaelic football, in county Gaelic football in 22. And the championship structure would say, or the way it's set up, is still letting down players in that regard. You put so much in over that time and mm. aren't getting that much out of it. James, could you have done it? Are you in it, as you say, for the love of the game? I don't I I don't know. I mean, I suppose when I was in 2010 when I started with Kerry, I was going to the states that summer. And if I'd gone I don't know where I'd have ended up. Do you know kind of way? Where were you going? <laughs> if you're in Vegas now like. <laughs> were you going to Boston? I'd be working a nightclub from out or in Vegas. No, I was going to yeah, we we're going to Boston and we made myself and Jonathan Lyne made the panel, but we didn't even know we made the panel. We we saw it on the Kerry GA website. We were number thirty and number twenty nine, because uh, we Who were in kind of half train. There was thirty on the panel. Who was thirty? Who, Who was, was thirty? Yeah, you were thirty. I, I was sick and <laughs> I was thirty. <laughs> but so we had the flights booked, the football lined up over there and everything. And a few quid, a few quid. Um, and we had to, I, she rang Fitzmaurice and said, look, we're, we were gone. We didn't think we'd make the panel. And he said, look, stick around. But like, if we'd gone, you know, you're coming back, you'd probably be looking to go again the following summer. Mm. It just wouldn't, I guarantee it wouldn't have happened for me anyway, if I'd gone that summer. But if you think about all those fellas, you were saying the tip lads, the cabin lads, like where are they working? They're probably working in Dublin. Mm. Like the commute there is, is horrible. Yeah. For training two days a week, like it's fine. Even for us down in Kerry, a lot of us are working in Kerry. You know, you're only going to maybe 
Clarny or Tralee, even for the lads who are in South Kerry, you're looking at a good hour and 15 minutes just to come training from South Kerry. Like, but look at look at Michael Quinlivan, for example. Park, a big, big park. Michael Quinlivan, for example, like all star, definitely nominee in 16, could have two all stars, wins his provincial title. He's 26, 27, 28. He's working mm-hmm. in Dublin, traveling back to tip. And he was one of those players who stepped away in 20. Pandemic cut us traveling short. He's not with Tip this year. A massive loss. Probably one of the most talented players in the province. But he's playing for one of those smaller counties. Like, I'm pretty sure Michael Quinnivan could fit into mm. Kerry, Dublin. Yeah. He'd do some job for Dublin right now. Do you know? Like, And it's like, it's just where you're from. And it's... The problem is, is that there's not enough of a carrot there for those teams. Like, those teams should get a chance to be playing in Crow Park. On the biggest days, so if it's not for the Sam Maguire, it should be for something else because they're the days that you remember. Yeah, so you have to have that. But that, that, that's what that, the GA are trying to do, that, like the Talton Cup, and they're trying to see they'd want to hurry up. Structures on. now, if you're yeah, losing players, like there's a problem. Yeah, but well, it's, look it's, at the it's, green, it's, the, it's green the green yeah, proposal, the green proposal is in for next year. I'll be honest, I can't bloody remember what it was because it's a bit of a wet drab, to be honest. I, I, I think it's a step in the right direction. It's it's not as exciting as it could be. It's a step in the right direction. And I also think the amount of emphasis that is put on Talchin Cup and the amount of interest that it's given, like that's important too. Like that's going to well, be a big thing. Because if you look at it, Tommy, it's like, it's not a surprise when players walk away from panels now. No. It's not. No. I mean, you're seeing it and it's like, there, there's definitely a, an apathy towards it. Even in media coverage of it, supporters be looking going like, I can see why he's stepping away there. You know, and that's that's not right. That that's it's gotten to that stage because of all the things we we, we touched on there. It's totally understand understandable when players say, "You know what? I've done this for a couple of years. I'm out," and that's why the proposals coming in, giving coverage to these competitions, restructuring it exactly what John Heslin's point there. Training for nine months for for three games, like mm-hmm. the GA is aware of it now. Is it perfect? The new solutions. Probably not, but like you said, it's a step in the right direction because it needs to be addressed sooner rather than later because you're just going to keep losing these guys. They need, to, they need to put all the games up. They need to put all the games on YouTube or put it up yeah. and make it accessible. Not, like, like, there was there's no, no covers at the weekend. Even. There's no highlights. Do you know, like it's like we're in a very jump. we we were in a very privileged position, yourself and Jimmy, playing in the counties we did and at the times we played with the match. But there's massive respect. For, for those players in the, the, the so-called smaller countries where they're not getting that that privilege and that kind of profile and coverage and the opportunity that the GA needs to address that or this issue is going to get worse and worse and worse. So mm. step well, in the right direction with what's happened now, restructuring yeah. from next season. But um, it's probably a little bit a little bit late. Um, so it, it needs to be covered. It needs to be done right and executed. It needs, needs to happen. James, last word to you on this and then we're going to nearly wrap every county looks after their players differently as well. Like the Kerry lads and the Dublin lads, you're going to get everything you want, everything you need, you know. Trips From, to Portugal there, Jimmy. Yeah, sounds nice. Yeah. Three times yeah. a year, was it? Like, <laughs> that was before the money dried up, yeah. I, <laughs> they used to fly Cork to Derry for National League games. How is some going? You're talking about Celtic Tiger? Or are you talking about... Yeah. To be fair, it was before. So you're, this <laughs> right is you with Tron Cork under the bus. Like, lads, so like, three you know, weeks like, in Portugal. Like, the recession. Tron Cork under the bus. <laughs> but even with dinners and things like that, and, you know, yeah, players are going to maybe give you a bit of extra leeway if you're playing in, in high this profile. This sounds great playing for Kerry, Jimmy. We never got any of this with Dublin. Like. <laughs> mm. I must have got down there. We never even got a meal after training. Like. We had no money. Yeah. You no. got... He, he got fed. What? Around. Did we? Where you where's, the, where's, where's your breakfast, source coming from here again? He got breakfast, lunch, and dinner year round. Did we? What? I was broke. I was out of pocket playing with him. <laughs> well, you would be out of pocket probably, but still, like, <laughs> even just to have to have your your meal after training, you probably get one to take away, or you get a meal for the following day. They all have the personal experience. chefs. Personal chefs, James. That's what they had. I was on cocoa pops after training with him. <laughs> You don't give anything away. Like. No one's buying that. No one's buying I'm that. I'm selling it. You just I'm got selling it. You got a check. Yeah, I was what we did. Yeah, we got paid. Sorry. We all worked for AIG. 
<laughs> all in the underwriting department for AIG, yeah. But I would wonder what what the other counties kind of the other county boards are giving the players. Mm. You know, like it's a given for maybe the bigger bigger counties who've had success what they're getting. But you know, what are the, the smaller crowds getting? They're probably not getting looked after as well either. It's easier to step away then. It, it's the conversation around the merger that we're seeing as well at the minute. I know it's a complicated issue, but like, you know, the LJFA and Camogie Association want to come in underneath the GA. And I think that needs to happen and it should happen. And there's yeah. different, various different blockades there. But you could imagine that the experience of a top tier LGFA footballer is quite different as well to the top of the top of the pop, say, in, in, in Gaelic football or hurling too. So it's, yeah. I Food for thought, Tommy. Food for mm. thought. Yeah. Listen, that was a that was a great question that was sent in. I must give okay. a shout out again to who said it, it was Brian. Do your own part on that. You really could, and we we'll come back to it. There's there's so much to dig into from that as well, and we'll grill Paddy again on where the food for the dubs has come from. James, we'll get to the bottom. I, of that. I, I honestly wish it was playing for Kerry, but it sounds like Jesus lads. <laughs> you were getting fed in the Shelburne. He actually had he had <laughs> rooms in the Shelburne. Nice to seven. stay in the Shelburne for the summer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. I get right. off this, Paddy. We've been okay. off for about four hours here, lads. So we're, oh, we're, we're gone. We're gone. Right. Last one, Paddy. Me and you are hopping on a call together on Thursday or Friday. I'm doing your fantasy switches for you. Okay? Yeah, you we're were doing it. Put it in All the right. diary. I'm Kevin not Ford. Thursday. Friday evening, I'll be on the road to Belfast. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Kevin Ford, don't, don't want to hear from you this week. You nearly have a 1,000 points. You're top of the table, 973. Jerry Hanley, second from Hunter Connacht and Cavan. And Darrow Connor from Kilbride is in third position. We'll come back to that and lots more next week. It's a box office weekend of football. Thank yeah. you very much for tuning in to episode seven of the Football Pod with Paddy Andrews and James Donahue. That is us for this week. We'll talk to you again soon. James, Paddy, thanks very much. Thank you. Night, gents. <laughs>